All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is Tate Hieronymus. Welcome to the show, man. What's up? It has been a long time coming. We were kind of talking off air. I've wanted to have you on the show for over a year or so, and it's finally happening. So I'm glad you're here, man. So <laughs> Look his ass. I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Let's talk about this Bigfoot thing. What got you interested in Bigfoot in the beginning? Oh, that's, you know, just, just the lack of of things to do as a child, I think, growing up. Because <laughs> that's kind of when, like, Monster Quest came out. I was, well, how old was I? I was pretty young. I was at least, like, I was, like, 12 or 13 when Monster Quest came out. And so, you know, a 12 or 13, you know, doesn't can't really go anywhere, doesn't drive. So that kind of left me wanting to, like, just be weird and look up weird stuff on the Internet. And then Monster Quest happened, and then, through Monster Quest, I found the Patterson Gimlin film, and then that kind of sent me down a spiral. Or I was like, I was watching that on YouTube like all the time. It's like that's so cool looking at what if that's real. And so it's just kind of like that's what really got me interested in the whole thing. And then I would just keep watching everything I could on Bigfoot, whether it like TV or YouTube, whatever I could find. And then that's really where it started. Just kind of as a kid, just with nothing to do really <laughs> well fast forward you're not only interested in bigfoot but here comes the bluff creek project where the patterson gimlin film was filmed talk a little bit about the bluff creek project how did you get involved in that and what is that exactly so yeah i got involved with the bluff creek project i think in 2016 um and it was originally uh the group was formed by steven strufert's um Ian Carton, I think we were like the two main founders of that group and Robert Leiterman. And they kind of, they, you know, they, they had an idea. There was like thing, like there was like ideas of where the film site was like, Oh, it was here, here. Like, you know, Bill Munns had an idea. Cliff Bergman had an idea. MK Davis had his theory. And then, you know, and Steven, wanted, they really wanted to like find where the actual film site was. And so they kind of just, we're looking at maps and everything and trying to figure out and they were hiking the Creek all, all the time and trying to find like, does this, is this the tree in the photo here? Does that match up here? And then where are the stumps there? So they were doing that for a little bit and then they eventually found the film site in 2011. So that's what the um, Bluff Creek project kind of started out to be. And then it became like a trail camera project. They were putting trail cameras down there, hopefully to catch pictures of a Bigfoot. Uh, walking through the area but unfortunately that hasn't happened yet um but due to that they were able to prove an animal that was thought to be extinct in the bluff creek area the humboldt area the humboldt martin um, because they got pictures of that on the trail camera and so because of that it's been proven that it's still a living animal in that area so it's not exactly bigfoot but it is a rare species that thought is thought to be endangered there so that's really cool it's one of the things I had Steven on the show last year and we talked about that when he was on the show and it's like, obviously you're trying to catch Bigfoot, but you did prove a species, even though it's not the one everybody wanted to see. It's a really cool thing that, that you guys are involved in. So you said you got involved in 2018. What, how did you get involved in that? And what has your involvement been since then? So, uh, yeah, you know, getting involved with that, I was just kind of going up there and, filming like little eight millimeter like well on my phone and then i used the eight millimeter app and i was like hey this is cool kind of cool and you know after going up there meeting all the guys kind of hit it off with them and i kept going up to the camp outs every year because they do like twice a year july and october so i get i kept going up with them and got to know them really well and kind of i was like hey i want to do this <laughs> this documentary about how you guys found the film site and so i, I went up there and did that one year and then that's kind of just, I just kind of fell into the group really. It, there wasn't like an initiation, like you had to like cut your hand and shake the other person's hand and mix blood. You like nothing like that or anything, but you know, just kind of doing like videos and stuff and kind of just fell in my own groove with the project itself with those guys. And it's kind of how, you know, that's how I really fell into it. Kind of my own thing doing with the, uh, with the Bluff Creek project. So, you know, and then um, just later on down the road, just kept doing my things for them, making videos and podcasts and 
the rest is history really i don't know what that bumping is is there something against your camera or your your microphone or you it might tapping? be my table oh you're tapping okay yeah stop tapping <laughs> so you guys are going out up at bluff creek this is an encounter show have you had experiences or encounters while you guys have been up there or you've been out there on your own well, my first time in 2015, I had something kind of weird happen. Something came around our tent. Um, it, it was like this weird, it came up from where the creek was, and the the shadow profile was pretty wide. Then it got like really skinny because like it was turning or something, and then turned back the same way and went away. I was like, you know, shadows don't do that, like especially at night. Because it's the Earth is rotating, so a shadow sh goes one way the whole time, not comes one way and comes back the same way, or left the same way it came from. So that was really weird. Can't say for sure. Um, heard some knocks out there before a couple times, and had some weird things happen. But yeah, I mean, there's it's not it's nothing like for sure to say Bigfoot. It was a Bigfoot, but it lines up with the behavior of what people report for Bigfoot um, encounters. So possibly had some weird stuff happen with Bigfoot related out there. When I talked to Steven, I asked him the same thing and he's like, you know, I've had some weird stuff that sounded weird or whatever. Have other people that you know of either involved in the project or otherwise had encounters or other things that go on in the Bluff Creek area? Oh yeah. Um, there was a buddy of mine, Jonathan Easley. Um, he had, he recorded this, well, he didn't, he wasn't trying to record it. He was just like kind of filming himself talking about his trip up there. Cause he was leaving that day. And um, it was like a weird anomaly. He recorded like this strange audio that just appeared out of nowhere on his camera and the tape. And he's like, what is that? And so I, I got to meet him and talked about it. And I was like, yeah, that's weird. And we, uh, I think the first time we met, we actually ended up, trying to replicate the sound to see if somebody could have made it. Um, so we were going to different spots in Laos camps and I was filming him and he was like dude, trying to do the yell in the video. And we found a spot that was pretty accurate, but he asked people if anybody did a call and they're like, no. So it's, it's really weird. And then when I was uh, with doing another documentary of mine in Bluff Creek in 2021, uh, small town monsters uh, Alex and Eli from beyond the trail were there and we had some stuff happen in Laird Meadow and then on the way to Laos camp some rocks conveniently fell on us and um, that it, it just it's just been some weird experiences the last few years of going out there um, but 2021 I think was definitely the most significant for possible Bigfoot activity that I've ever had in the Bluff Creek area of since my years of going out there um it's it, it's hard it's weird to say but i think is it all coincidence or is it really bigfoot happy you know stuff from bigfoot going on I, I can't say but i'm tending to lean towards bigfoot and my opinion on that one well we've mentioned it a couple of times let's talk a little bit about the pg film i don't i certainly don't want to get into a breakdown about it. we've done that ad nauseum on the show <laughs> Everybody who listens to the show kind of knows where I stand on the PG film. Five days out of seven, I'm right there that it's a real creature caught on film. The other two days of the week, I'm like, eh, I'm not so sure. You've been involved in the project. You've been there. You filmed where that was filmed. And you've got to experience that like most people don't get to experience it. And you have watched it plenty of times. Where are you? And you've also interviewed Bob Gimlin and talked to Bob about it. At so, the film site, yeah. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the film itself and where are you on its authenticity and is that a real Sasquatch? Is Patty the real deal? I think Patty is the real deal. You know, it's... People always, like, are, like... There's the whole thing, did, like... Um, was it John Chambers who did the costume design for Planet of the Ace? Is that his name? Is that... Yes, I think he did it? Course. I think there was like rumors that he made the costume, but he definitely didn't. Um, but even then, like the technology wasn't there to make something that good and that real looking. It just wasn't. And then I think I messaged you like a few days ago and 
you mentioned um, the guy that supposedly sold Roger the costume, Philip Morris. Um, and I remember watching a whole thing they did for another TV show, recreating the film and the Pete and the suit. <laughs> it was horrible. It didn't look anything like it. But like if you're the guy that made the suit in the original PG 1967 film, you should be able to replicate that with better technology. Now it doesn't, it doesn't add up. And so the fact that it hasn't been replicated, like the suit, I think that, you know, says volumes in my opinion. Um, and then like, why would you go in the middle of nowhere to film a video like that or film like that? It It's weird to say the least, but I mean, like, again, we were talking before we started this. Um, there's also things that could go against it being real, like with the Aldi at Lee and stuff like that. And Roger's shady character. Um, so it's just like the fact that it hasn't been proven real yet and it hasn't been proven fake keeps me going. And I'm for me personally, I'm about 95% sure that it's real. I allow that 5% for skepticism and be like, I'm willing to talk about it and kind of entertain the idea, but I'm pretty set on the film being real. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, five days out of seven, I'm right there with you. And I think you're talking about the the making of Bigfoot documentary they did with Greg Lyon or based on the Greg Lyon book where they did this ridiculous <laughs> costume from the guy who actually said he made the, the Patty <laughs> costume. It was the craziest thing I'd ever seen with these extensions and this sort of gorilla-like hand that they put this guy in with these. They claimed it, you know, it was made with the the football pads. And I'm like, this shit does not make any sense whatsoever. Like, uh -uh. And, and you're the guy who supposedly produced this for Roger Patterson. If that's the case, set everything else aside. Just pull out another suit that's identical to the one that was filmed at Bluff Creek and lay it all to rest. But that's never happened. So I'm with you. I think it, it lives on and I think it will always be some sort of a topic of conversation in the Bigfoot community. There's people on all sides of, the controversy around it. There's even been things out in the last couple of years about supposedly Bob Gimlin has come out and said it's fake and there's going to be this deathbed confession. And there was this back and forth with Russell Accord and like Richter, Richter Rio. Yeah. You know, I got, I, I actually had Steve uh, Coles on the show after that happened because Steve was involved in it and we kind of broke it down after he had the conversation with Russell. And I'm like, you know, it's all, it's, it's all really speculation, right? I think everybody's just trying to be, relevant or kind of be like oh I'm, I'm in the know and i know what's going on and i think it's just i think it's just that and they're just kind of going back and forth at it like a boxing match and it's just it's kind of hysterical if you think about it because like at this point i i, I mean at this point it yeah it would be disappointing if the film was fake but it would be more incredible if the film was fake than if it was real because how did they pull that off for you know and keep that going for so many years it you know what i'm saying the fact that it could be fake and nobody's been able to prove it up to this day is more incredible than the film actually being real itself i it's totally like, how, agree how do they do that <laughs> right and i've said it so many times on the show too when you're going back and forth and the debate seems to become more about if the patterson gimlin film is fake and patty's not real then bigfoot isn't real and that's absolutely ludicrous because they can exist separate from one another. Patty can be fake. That film can be fake. And Bigfoot in and of itself as a phenomenon can still be real. That one piece of film doesn't is not the end all be all for the entire phenomenon of Bigfoot. It doesn't negate other anecdotal stories. It doesn't negate other Bigfoot footage, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about that and we'll get there shortly. I want to talk a little bit about the podcast. You mentioned it briefly about the Bluff Creek Project podcast. Talk a little bit about how that came into being and what is your role in the podcast? So, yeah, the podcast was kind of like, how, how do I say it? It was a, it came about because of COVID really. And I was just kind of wanted to do something i floated the idea before maybe like hey we could start a podcast or whatever and it just didn't really happen and then covid happened and we were all home 
home jailed, if that makes sense. So we couldn't really go anywhere. I was like, hey, this will be a fun time. And then I could at least interview all the people that have been involved in the Blue Free Project. And the original idea was to like interview people who have been to the film site who are involved with the Blue Free Project. Um, you know, so and that's kind of how it started. And then um it kind of grew from there and kind of just, you know, and that was my first time doing like interviews. I've been interviewed, but that was my first time actually interviewing. And it's you get better with time the more you interview so and then my kind of my role for it is you know the curator or creator of the podcast and uh one of the main hosts and then the editor and then publisher and i did all the scheduling so and i still do a lot of that still to this day um i mean we're kind of on a hiatus right now but we're gonna be coming back in march so so i still get that same role of get you know getting guests signed up and editing and publishing and stuff gotcha out of all the interviews you've gotten a chance to do what has been your favorite or most impactful (laughs) who's been the the person that you've interviewed so far that you've really enjoyed the most or learned the most from oh man so, well, there's a few interviews I didn't do that I really enjoyed. Um, there's one, a couple that Robert, or there was one that Robert did. I can't remember the name, but Robert um, interviewed this guy. I was like, this, this is, this is some great stuff. I think he was a logger in Humboldt, that kind of area, and he had some weird stuff happen. I, I can't remember the name. I'm sorry, I'm break, blanking on that. Um, but my, I'd have to pick two favorite interviews. One was kind of like a joke kind of a thing, but it was still really, really cool. Um, so the guy that plays Dwight Schrute on The Office, Rain Wilson, his wife is actually a friend of mine, and I've met Rain and then his wife a couple of times. And their, one of their assistants reached out to me. He's like, hey, Rain's doing this podcast called Dark Air and Terry Carnation, and he wants to come on your show um, as Terry Carnation and do like a thing because he knows you're into big films. I was like, yes. <laughs> So we, that was a little fun, and so I had him on there. Um, and then I, my favorite one that I had on there that was pretty, as a filmmaker, just a, a nerd myself, was Eduardo Sanchez, who co-directed The Blair Witch Project and uh, the Bigfoot movie Exists. So I got to talk with him about that, and, and that was another interesting thing, kind of leading back to the Patterson Gimlin film about money and how much a suit would cost to have made. Cause I think when he said they made the costume for the movie exist in today's money it was about $200,000. That's a lot of money back then in 67 to make something. And that's a movie that looks decently good for, you know, the technology today, but imagine 67 with of that money or more to make something look real. Yeah, it's a ton of money now. And that's that's one of the things that, you know, some people look at it as a red herring, that it takes a lot of money to to hoax things. You know, that comes up a lot when I've, I've talked about Todd Standing in the past on the show. You know, oh, he doesn't have the money to to hoax that kind of stuff. Well, you know, you don't know what people are making and how they're making their money. And, and like you and I were talking about a little bit off air before we came on, you don't know who's back and who, right? And L.D. Atley had a lot of money. And we even talked a little bit about Tom Slick and some of the things that Tom was involved in and funding a lot of research into Bigfoot, because I tell you, people invest money in things that are going to make them money. And if you truly believe these things exist and you want to be the one to make that discovery, people are willing to put a lot of money into that discovery because there's going to be a huge return on their investment if and when you're the one, the person who takes one of these things down, brings in a body or just gives that whatever, maybe it's even video evidence. I don't think that's going to happen outside of a body, but whatever it is that brings this out to the forefront and you are the person who proves this as a species, there's a ton of money to be made there. So, you know, as far as the money behind whatever, there's there's tons of that out there. and We don't necessarily know who's behind what, but 200 grand in 1967, I don't know what that is in real time money, but it's a shit ton <laughs> of money, right? It's a, It's a lot, yeah. It'd probably be what close to a million 
Maybe. Oh, at least, at least. Well, I'll have to do the conversion. By the time this airs, I'll have to do the conversion and put it in the intro for everybody who's trying to do. People are probably taking off their shoes and, and trying to count what that would be. <laughs> I'll put that in the intro for everybody so you won't have to be Googling during the, the listening part of the show. Let's talk a little bit about the evidence and why it is we're talking. We're still talking about it. It's, as we record this now, it's January 2nd, 2023. And we're still not completely 100% sold on whether this thing is real or not. You know, I personally believe they are five days out of seven. I'm kind of like with the PG film five days out of seven. I've had so many compelling conversations with people. You know, I'm 250 plus episodes into the show now. And I believe that people are experiencing and seeing something. But as it stands, I was a guest on a show recently, a couple of days ago, and we were having this conversation about the evidence and where we are. And it was sort of a closeout for 2022 and looking at the past year in Sasquatchery and what happened and what didn't happen. And Pat, the host of the show I was on on Squatch Talk, made the reference to the football field. And he literally said, okay, 67, the Patterson-Gimlin film put Bigfoot and the Bigfoot phenomenon on the five-yard line. And we've been on the five-yard line since 1967. And there's been very few things since then that has moved the ball at all, if any of this exists or if you believe any of this at all. So let me ask you this question. What is, in your opinion, maybe it's the Patterson-Gimlin film, maybe it's something else. Is there something that has stuck out to you over the years that you feel may have moved the the ball down the field a little bit as far as evidence? What's the best evidence you feel that you, either you've seen personally or you're aware of that's out there in the zeitgeist? It's funny. like, So, yeah, I love the Patterson-Gimlin film, but I mean – in my opinion, I mean, this might rub people the wrong way saying it, but I think it's the PG film is not evidence. It shows something, but doesn't really mean anything. Like you can, a photo doesn't really mean evidence. In my opinion, it, it has to be physical to be evidence. And that's where I think like the, the tracks are really important um, evidence wise. Cause like even hair analysis, that's kind of still, kind of it's it's not as known evidence as like you know track analysis footprint analysis um and then several people come to mind when it comes to like that kind of thing is cliff barrickman and obviously jeff meldrum and so the fact that there's like different tracks found in all parts of the united states and they all kind of show the same type of features that i think that lends um, more credibility to the cre- you know the phenomenon being real um and i think that's helping get the ball rolling um and hopefully more like this whole edna thing hopefully that kind of will start taking off and help kind of get the ball rolling even more so just i mean at this point yeah it's kind of stagnant water it's at a standstill um still <laughs> um yeah, like anything short of a body, I don't think it's really going to be moving any much further than this. Well, let's talk a little bit about the last year. We just closed out 2022. We're in a brand new year. Like I said, January 2nd, we're going full steam ahead into 2023. Is there anything in your mind that stuck out to you that happened or didn't happen in the Bigfoot world over the course of 2022? Not that I can think of. Um, just outside of my personal experiences that I maybe had some stuff happen. Um, I think it kind of just really has been the same thing uh, for a little bit. And then, you know, I mean, there's been some really cool things that happened, like some books were published and stuff like that. But outside that, I don't think anything really groundbreaking that stood out in my mind that makes me go like, Oh man, we're getting closer. (laughs) That's just my opinion. Um, But again, somebody else could say something different. Yeah. I'm kind of right there with you. That's one of the things that Pat and I were talking about over on Squatch talk the other night. And Pat was a little jaded about the last year. And I I'm kind of right there with him. I, I sort of agreed and disagreed because Pat's point was, again, we're on the five yard line with the PG film and we've been there since 67 and there's really nothing outside of, he talked about the Alaskan Bigfoot movie that small town monsters and Alex and Eli and, 
and those guys over at Small Town Monsters put out. And Seth talked about that when he was on the show with me. I haven't seen the film yet. I wanted to see it first, and then I want to have Alex and Eli on the show to talk about it. But, you know, outside of that for Pat, it was sort of the, that was really the highlight of his 2022 in Bigfoot. And, you know, I said, I understand where you're coming from. And I, I feel you when it comes to this public Bigfoot phenomenon. And there wasn't a ton of evidence out there that came to light that wasn't a hoax, in my opinion, that really happened over the last year, really over the last decade. But I disagreed because I've had so many people on the show over the last really two years that are out there boots on the ground. There's a lot of people in the trenches that are really trying to push this discovery and find that evidence that's going to maybe push that ball at least five or 10 yards down the field. So at least for me, that was a little bit of some hope to be able to talk to people that are really interested in the subject. Being able oh, to talk- yeah, like. I agree. You know, I like getting out in the field. You know, I'm out in the field as much as I can be with having a a job and living in Florida because I'll go in Florida and then I usually travel to California every year. Um, So, I mean, I get out as much as I can. So, and I can't say I've had some weird stuff happen during my times out in the field this year, for sure. Like there's, there's been stuff that, or that has been happening to me that make me think this is still, there's still stuff out here, but I get nothing like I can say that has really stood out to me. That's made me think, like I said before, that the ball is going to be moving past that five yard line. Well, let's talk a little bit about Florida while we're talking about it. I've had Stacy Brown on the show. We talked about his thermal footage and I've had Connor Flynn on the show. Who's in Florida. I've had Marie Dumont who's down in Florida. Tons of people. There's uh, David. I can't remember his last name. From Florida, we talked about the skunk ape. Let's talk a little bit about the difference in the species. We're all over the place. I love it. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah. if, if any of this is real at all. Florida is known for the skunk ape. And I've had people on the show that have claimed to have had encounters with the skunk ape down in Florida. Obviously, Stacy got his footage down in Florida. So if he filmed it, it would be considered a quote unquote skunk ape. What do you think about the difference in the species and the difference in these anecdotal encounters that people have when they actually see these things, skunk apes, and I'm doing the air quotes, look a lot different than, you know, the seven, eight, nine feet tall Sasquatch that people purport to see or report to see up in the Pacific Northwest. What do you make of that? Do you think these things are in Florida? Cause I tell you, I had Peter Byrne on the show this past year and Peter and I argued a little bit about that. That was one of the things that we disagreed about. You know, he's like, they don't exist, you know, east of the. Uh, yep, rock. yep. <laughs> and I just don't believe that. So, no. what do you think? What say you about the skunk ape and the difference in maybe what we see in the Pacific Northwest versus in Florida? Yeah, well, for one, I agree with you. I think there's Sasquatch east of the Rockies and west of the Rockies. So, that, and then footprint analysis going back to like Meldrum, that can shut the door and close that argument pretty quick um i think as far as what like the species i think it's the same i mean this is just again my opinion i'm not quote, saying facts or anything in my opinion it's the same creature um obviously because it's just the terminology that they have have for it down here as a skunk cape because like in missouri you got the momo which is still bigfoot what, what is ohio is the Grassman or something like that it's bigfoot is it's the, you report the same atom, anatomical features, you know, it's, you got the wood knocks, you got the whoops, you got whistles and stuff like that. It's the same thing that you have reports in from the Pacific Northwest. I think it's just that region's name for that creature in that area. Um, I do think they're smaller in size because like, was it Bird, Bird, is that, am I saying it right? Birdman's rule or Birdman's law. The closer you get to the equator, the smaller the animals are. I mean, and you can see, like, if you see, like, a deer or mountain lion or bear here in southern Florida, they're going to be a lot smaller than what you see, like, the further north you go. Um, and as far as the smell that people report to that, I, Florida's hot and humid, man. Maybe they just sweat and need a bunch of deodorant. It's not as bad in the, you know, Pacific Northwest. It's more dry and, and stuff, but. But hey, it's humid up in New York and stuff and Ohio, so I, I I don't know. 
Yeah, I'm right there with you. That That's something I take. My entire show is based on encounter stories. So I talk to anybody and everybody who's had an encounter and literally maybe 5% more probably like two to 4% of the people I talk to ever have anything to do with any kind of smell when they have a close encounter with these things. So I think it's more of if that's happening, it's a, it's an environmental thing. Like they're down in the swamps and it's just a natural odor. You know, a lot of people have thought that there may be something more to it as far as glands, that these things are secreting things that make the smell. I don't know. It is what it is, but there's all, there's all this other stuff that's going on in the, the cryptic community. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And where are you on other cryptids? Like Dogman has been a thing that's been on my radar over this last year. I've had a couple of people on, you know, I've been doing the show for a while now, 250 plus episodes. And I've literally had three people on the show that have claimed to have had Dogman encounters. Yet there are other shows who will go unnamed out there who have 800 episodes of Dogman encounters. It's That's all they do, right? And recently I've had the guys from the Kentucky X-Files, Denny and Tyler and Josh have been on the show a couple of times. And Denny sent me some stuff recently that blew my mind. And it was about these freaking wild kangaroos that are across North America. Yeah, I see your face. These things, it's real. They, they, there are populations of kangaroos. And these things are like six feet tall when they're standing on their hind legs. And they're buff as shit, man. They look like they've been to the gym, right? They've got a membership. <laughs> And Denny has made it clear on the show a couple of times. He believes that these are responsible for at least some of what people are reporting to be encounters with Dogman. Now, I've had a couple of people, like I said, three people in the history of the show, two this past year that were on. D.A. Roberts comes to mind, and I had Bettina Moss from Crypto Normal Encounters on. And they both have pretty significant encounters with what they believe to be Dogman. Let's just talk about that. Let's leave all the other stuff. Let's not get into chupacabra and deep waters here. Let's talk about Dogman specifically. Where are you on the belief that there is a possibility that something like Dogman exists or even coexists maybe, if Sasquatch are real, out in North America? Where where are you on that? Do you believe it's a, a real thing? Do you, pe- do you believe people are seeing something that they may be misidentifying? What, what do you think about Dogman? I don't. So, yeah, bluntly, I don't think it's real. <laughs> just flat out um in my re i mean i'm not discrediting people who say they've probably seen something you know and then i try to do the same thing with people who've seen bigfoot it's like i don't want to say you didn't because who am i to say you know but in my opinion there's not as much anecdotal reference and um physical evidence to really back a creature like that there i mean you need repeated footprint evidence, audio analysis, you know, evidence. um, I mean, even photos for that, for that matter. And yeah, like there's a lot of photos that are fake of Bigfoot, but there's a lot of legit photos throughout the United States. There's a lot of tracks that are coming out. There's audio analysis, there's hair being found. Um, And then people are reporting the same thing all over. And even the Native Americans are talking about Sasquatch, but you don't really hear much about Dogman. It's kind of, I think Dogman's more like, a more recent cryptid that kind of developed in my opinion. I just don't think there's enough evidence to support the, the support that could be a real creature. That's just one man's honest opinion. Yeah. And I appreciate that. It, it is a subjective thing. I mean, nobody really knows. And that's one of the things I pride myself about my show is it's a safe place to come tell your encounter stories. And I never have anybody on the show that I don't believe believes that they had the encounter that they're talking about, you know, like DA Roberts, for example, he does DA ex machina over on YouTube, former military, former law enforcement. And I know that when DA tells me his story, he's not making that up. He had some sort of encounter. He saw something that he can't explain that he attributes to being dog man. And I'll be honest, you know, I think it's a possibility that at least some of these, maybe not all, but at least some of them are misidentifications of maybe as crazy as it sounds, a kangaroo or even there's wild baboons and other things that people have brought over here that have, it's a proven fact they've escaped either zoos or they've escaped from transport. There's all kinds of wild things out there. And I tell you, when you're in the woods, you know, 
literally, I, but I was telling you before we went on the air, I went out to put my chickens up. Yep. <laughs> I heard some weird shit in my woods and some snapping of branches and what sounded like footfall, you know, 50 yards into my woods and I'm shining the flashlight and I'm like, well, Tate's waiting on me. I got to go. I don't have time to go and explore this. But when you hear stuff like that, my heart starts beating, my adrenaline starts pumping. And I guarantee you, if a kangaroo had hopped up behind my tiny house here in North Carolina, I would have shit a brick. <laughs> and I would have no explanation for what I saw because there's not supposed to be a kangaroo in North Carolina. Just, nope. just as much as they're not supposed to be a dog man anywhere, right? So, and it's true. And you know what's funny? Because like, kind of, I think of it this way in a little bit. Like a lot of misidentifications. Um, so think about like people who are like you know seasoned people in the field that look for Bigfoot. They can get freaked out in situations, and their imagination can run wild. And this is people who have been doing it for years. And they might see something that was something else because yeah, you're a Bigfoot researcher and you, you kind of are more used to it, but at the same time you're seeing something that's not supposed to be real. Now you add that like somebody who's not really into the subject at all, but they just see something that's not, you know, abnormal. Their mind's going to probably, uh, what's the word? Um, exaggerate that you know their imagination is going to exaggerate more than somebody who's used to being out in the field like a researcher like for any kind of subject yeah i totally agree man it can happen to anybody and i think that's one of the the pitfalls that some of us that are in the community and into this kind of thing sort of fall into is you got those people that go out into the woods and everything becomes bigfoot right you know if anything snaps or they hear a footfall or <clears throat> whatever the case may be, they think it's a Bigfoot or they immediately go to that. I'm the complete opposite. I do a Bigfoot show, but I'm probably one of the most skeptical people when it comes to Bigfoot because I want proof. I want some sort of evidence because if you're making these fantastic claims, then you have to have some pretty fantastic evidence, in my opinion, to back up those claims, unless it's just an anecdotal story that you're telling about an encounter, which I get. We've talked a little bit about footprints and, you know, I, I mentioned to you, I don't know if we talked about it on air or off air, but I've had Tom Shea on the show from Northern Kentucky. And Tom has had some amazing success with casting some of, in my opinion, some of the best castings out there of footprints and even like a, an elbow, I think, and a handprint and a butt print. And I know he sends a lot of his stuff to Cliff, you know, and Cliff has a lot of the things that, that Tom has casted. He even got some finger castings of where he put you know peanut butter out and something stuck some fingers down into the peanut butter and <laughs> there's all kinds of this stuff out there and we've got the patterson Gimlin film we've got other evidence i see videos i posted a video on my tiktok just a couple of days ago that a guy sent me from northern wisconsin and it's a pretty close up of what he purports to be the face of a sasquatch sort of behind this tree and it's, I think before we count on air, I was live on TikTok a little bit and it's got like 240,000 views on my TikTok channel. Jeez. And people are, it's, it's a polarizing thing, right? Either that's, I absolutely see what this guy is saying, or this is 100% paradoxical bullshit. And, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I don't exactly see what this guy sees. And there was a follow-up video that he sent me of this purported Bigfoot that looked like it was grinning and showing its teeth. So <laughs> there's a lot of evidence out there is my point. And here we are in 2023, you know, talking about this subject and we're no closer to the field goal or the, the goal line than we were in 1967. My question to you is why do you think it is that we're sitting here now in 2023 talking about this subject and we're no closer to getting to discovery. Why do you think we're having such a hard time getting hard evidence? If these things exist and there is a population that's sustainable in, let's just say North America, let's say Canada and all these other places that are, people report seeing these things. Let's talk about the continental United States. Why do you think it is that we're still so far away from the ultimate discovery and proving that these things are real? Um, Honestly, they might be fake. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just, there's two sides of a coin. <laughs> you know, there's heads or tails. So these things are either real or they're not. Um, 
and that just could be the the absolute truth of the you know the fact of the matter is that they're just not real um and i mean personally i'm a believer in that they're they're 95 percent real again i like to allow that five percent that i'm wrong um but that honestly that's just the yeah they're either real or they're not and i think it, if the if it's because we're no closer to the truth is because they're not real you know and that's just the way it is <laughs> i don't like saying it but it's the truth well you could be right it's it's like i have conversations about we were talking about dogman earlier I've had conversations with people on the show about dog man. And I, I say, you know, people are seeing something and there's a little bit of evidence out there, but the, the barometer has to be for evidence. In my opinion, like for other cryptids, for example, like dog man, there has to be enough evidence out there, at least as much evidence for them as there is Bigfoot. And there's not, as far as I know, it's related to dog man, but it's overwhelming as far as the anecdotal, if you just take the anecdotal stories for Bigfoot, for example, it is, overwhelming. <laughs> it is, you know, there's tons of shows out there like mine who do encounter stories and there's tons of people out there who are sharing those encounters. And I don't think all of those people are making up what they're saying. I don't think they're misidentifying what they're seeing. And I don't think they're lying about their encounters. So if you just take the anecdotal stuff, you know, I was talking to Pat recently about the uh, anecdotal stories and why science isn't getting involved in Sasquatch research. You know, there's just not enough scientific people out there taking a hard look at this. And the people that are out in the woods are amateur researchers for the most part, right? They're amateur scientists. They're citizen scientists that are trying to get these answers for themselves. And when I was having a conversation with Russ um, recently, and it's like, there's probably maybe 100, 150 people, maybe 200 people that are really serious researchers that are out in the woods X amount of days a year. And you multiply and that's not that. not a very big group. It's not a very big group. Right. And when I say Russ, I'm talking about Dr. Russell Jones, Russ Jones. And he's probably 200 days a year he's out in the field if he can right? If he can take time away from his practice, he's a practicing, practicing physician. So if he can take time away from the practice, he's in the woods looking for Bigfoot. And he's had very few encounters, maybe a couple of sightings that he had, but that's rare, right? And when you multiply that out, it sort of puts it in perspective that if there's not a ton of people looking, maybe that's the other side of the coin. Maybe that's why they're successful in hiding from us because and not enough of us are looking, you know, I'm looking from behind the microphone, collecting anecdotal stories. I'm not out in the woods actively looking for them. So the few people that are a couple of them have experiences. Some don't, you know, I had Thomas Steinberg on the show last year and Thomas has been looking for these things for 50 years and he hadn't seen shit, you know, <laughs> Peter Byrne was the same way. Well, I so, mean, <laughs> Peter Byrne, I like, I like the guy. I never met him, but I, you know, I admire because of his background. But if he's only believing that Sasquatch is east or west coast, then you're pretty limited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about 2023. Here we are. We're in 2023. What do you see on the horizon? Do you have high hopes for 2023? Do you have anything <laughs> big coming up? Do you do you see us getting any closer to? I know you're not clairvoyant. I'm not asking you to make any kind of you know psychic <laughs> abilities here and predictions, but where would you like to see us go in 2023? Do you think we're going to get closer to discovery? Do you have any big things on the horizon for you and what you're working on? So, yeah, I would like for the subject in general. I don't know. That's a hard one to say what I would like to see because I would like to see another like great photo or something like that. A really good photo that, I mean, that's obviously something that'd be really cool, but. That's hard to come by. Um, I can't, I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that one, I guess. Maybe just, yeah, I, yeah, I don't have one. But as far as like for me, um, I'll just plug this in real quickly. Um, I did this documentary series uh, this uh, last year, 2022, called A Search for Sabe. So I kind of, it was originally going to be a one episode thing and then it turned out to be four part series. And it, 
people the reaction from people seem to like it and so for me i think that's going to be like my thing i'm going to start doing i'm going to start trying to grow my youtube channel and then use that series to kind of grow it and so i kind of just it was really going to be a four-part series but i'm I'm, I'm probably going to do like different regions of the united states and go to these different areas and make episodes out of it and um kind of see where that series takes me so that's kind of something i'm going to be working on a lot this year uh see if see if i can get doing that and then um, i'm going to be working with some uh, doing something with small town monsters again um this year so that'll be fun um gonna this will be the last year for the bluff creek project podcast i'm announcing that now because i just well i say the last thing you know it can always come back again but I'm going to take it a, at a year at a time and see how I'm feeling about it. Cause as you know, podcasting is a lot of work. So that's kind of like, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to doing this year. So the film documentary series and then the podcast, and that's really about it so far. Well, tell us where everybody can find you've done a couple of documentaries. I think you got three under your belt now, if I'm not mistaken, tell everybody where they can find those plug your YouTube channel and while the podcast is going, I guess they can get it on any of the podcast apps, but tell us where they can find all of your stuff. So, yeah, um, you can find my documentaries uh, on my YouTube channel, Tate Hieronymus, T-A-T-E-H-I-E-R-O-N-Y-M-U-S, just that on uh, YouTube. Um, and then the Bluff Creek Project podcast on YouTube, just look that up. So, yeah, it's funny. You said... <laughs> It was, we did have it on like Spotify and iTunes, but I don't make enough money to be posting it and getting it everywhere on all these different platforms because it does cost money. So I'm going to stick with YouTube, grow the YouTube channel and kind of go from there. And I think once we can start getting some money from that, maybe use that to kind of pay for getting the podcast elsewhere. So everything's going to be YouTube for now. Um, kind of stick into that platform. It seems to be a good platform to grow and everything. And so I like it. So yeah, you can look me up on there and you can reach out to me on Facebook. That's a, the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome. I'll link to all that in the show notes. Tate Hieronymus, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I've had a blast talking to you. Oh, for sure. Thank you for having me.